Welcome. So I was molested when I was seven years old. And I've been on the sexual healing journey for about 12 years. And there are 10 things that I really wish I had known before going in this journey to know what I was getting into, how long it was gonna take, what is the process going to be. Um, so this video is about sharing those with you because I know that there are people who haven't yet started this journey who are wondering what that's gonna look like. I know there are people who have various uh, types of sexual abuse in their past, but they don't even know that there is a sexual healing journey to go on. I have also know that there are some of you who are right in the middle of it. You're right there with me and you're wondering like, how long is this gonna take or when is this gonna ever end? And feeling a little bit stuck or frustrated. And I also know that there are some partners out there who are going along this journey with someone that you love and you are kind of lost about where this is going, how to support. So this is what this video is about and I'm gonna walk you through the 10 things. Stick around until the end, because at the end, I'm gonna share with you a little bit about what's happening now for me, how I'm still recovering, what my current phase is, and why that is important to you. And because at the end of the day, I think we are going through this together and it is a journey. And so I'm still in it. And so at the end, I'm gonna share with you what that looks like today in my life. I'm gonna be referring to my notes because I have a lot that I wanna share with you. So if I'm looking down here, that is why. So take a second to please like this video, give it a thumbs up, subscribe to my channel, and be sure to leave a comment. That really helps me to keep being able to do videos like this. And if you're wondering, like, who the heck am I? If you're just stumbling across this video, uh, my name is Janelle Frazier, and I am a sexual abuse survivor, but I also am a relationship coach, and I specialize in sexual healing for women and helping couples navigate the challenges with intimacy and communication when it comes to their sexuality. So let's get in to these 10 things. Let's start with number 10 and we'll count our way down. So the 10th thing that I wish that I had have known whew, was that this is a big deal. Like I wish someone told me, I wish it was educated in school. I wish my parents had talked about this, that sexual abuse is a big deal. And although my parents didn't know and people in my life didn't know that this was happening to me, I wish I got the message and that I knew that it was a big deal. I wish I knew that what I experienced was sexual abuse. I wish I knew that it wasn't okay. And I think so many of us have experiences that I talk to women all the time who have experiences that are sexual abuse, that are causing sexual abuse symptoms into their life and into their relationship, yet they either haven't labeled it as abuse or they have never been taught that it is abuse and that that is a big deal and that they are valid to feel those things. So I had no idea the effects that this was going to create in my life. The way I like to think about it now, 12 years into my healing journey, that my, the sexual abuse felt like an initiation of a ripple effect of every area of my life, every bit of who I am and how I came to be who I am and all the patterns I created, not just in sex and relationships, but in every aspect of my life, it created this ripple effect that created me and it couldn't have not done that because any any event in our life can create ripple effects but specifically when we experience trauma um, it is a significant event in our life that will have an impact and I wish I had have known starting this journey and when I was seven and when I was 15 and at some point before now realized that this really was a big deal um, I was abused when I was 17, or sorry, when I was seven by a teenager. And I believed that for most of my life, you know, even up until a few years ago, that because I knew who did it, because I remembered what happened, I always had known what happened. It was never a repressed memory for me. I felt like I was good. And I hear a lot of people are like, yeah, well, like, I already, I know everything that happened. It's like, 
they kind of just leave their sexual healing at that. And trust me, there is so much more. This is a big deal. There is so much room to grow and there is so much room to uh, transform through any of the struggles you're having that you might not even be aware of that are linked back to those events. So being able to actually acknowledge it as abuse was a really big deal for me. So I was um, only aware of this issue. I didn't go out seeking sexual healing. I didn't go out thinking, oh, I was abused. I should start working on healing that. The only reason that I started navigating this journey was because I was in a relationship. I was in a relationship with a man, boy at the time, that I loved, that I thought I loved, that I wanted to be with, that I thought I wanted to be with. And I was completely confused as to why I didn't want to have sex, why I was never turned on, why I was never in the mood, why I would cringe when he touched me, why I would avoid, avoid intimacy at all costs. And then of course that was creating significant issues in our relationship and fights and tension and like, should we even be together? And so that was actually the reason why I went down this rabbit hole. Um, so for most people, their sexual healing journey, like mine, doesn't necessarily begin because they re because they actually are aware of the ways that their abuse has impacted them. We go on this journey because something we have a problem in our life that we're trying to solve, and then we sort of understand that that links back to the sexual abuse. Let me know in the comments if that makes sense. So I. I really didn't know that my sexual abuse was even linked to the issues that I was experiencing in my relationship, but I decided I didn't know what was going on. And so I decided to go see this counselor. And so I'm sitting waiting to see this counselor. I've never told anybody that I have been sexually abused. I'm not even labeling it that at the time, but I am shaking. I'm like looking over my back because I'm in university and I'm like, who's going to see me walk into this counselor's office? They know they're, you know, I don't want anyone to see me to know that I'm getting help or that I'm struggling. Like I didn't tell any of my roommates. I didn't tell anybody that I was going to see this woman. And so I'm sitting in the office and I'm so nervous and I just want to leave. I want to leave because I don't even know why I'm there. And I've never, I felt, I've never got help before. I never got professional help. I just was terrified to say the least and I honestly didn't really know what she was going to do or how it was going to help so I get into the office and I sit down and all she says is why are you here I am bawling instantly I'm hyperventilating I I don't even know consciously why I'm here but it was like my body knew why I was there and so I just said I think I was like abused or molested or raped or, or I don't know. I, I had sex really young and, and I don't want to have sex with my partner now. And I, and I just stopped. I like, didn't, I just didn't know. I'm like, I, I I don't know what to call it. I don't want to, I feel weird even calling it abuse. Like how dare I call it abuse? Like, you know, I was like a willing participant. This is still what my mind is thinking. And so I just had no idea. And I really believe that the, just the education and the conversations in our homes and in our schools around sexual abuse and what's consent and not consent and what's right and what's not right is so far from where it needs to be. And I mean, I was 18 years old having this conversation with a counselor and still not aware it was far into my 20s far into my sexual healing journey where i could actually acknowledge that this was a big deal so um before i move on to the next one i will let you know that i have another video if you want to watch about how i told my parents that i was sexually abused and it was from this counseling session that i did finally start having conversations with my parents and with my partner about what was going on to sort of get this ball rolling. And this was a huge start in my journey. And so if you're in the beginning of your journey, counseling is so beautiful for this because it really helps you just to talk about it, helps you to understand it, not just remember it, but understand it and think through it and get your lips literally wrapped around how what happened to you. And so um, to me, that was a really, important place for me to start and always a place that I recommend 
um, people start is just starting to have conversation about it without necessarily trying to get anywhere, just actually trying to understand it and label it what it was and realize the impact and, and understand that it is a big deal. Um, so the ninth thing that I wish that I had have known was that this was going to take a long time. Part of me actually feels a little bit concerned. I'm like, would I have continued on the journey if I knew how big of a deal this really was? <laughs> if I knew how much this impacted me? Uh, I'm still unsure, but in this moment, I do. I wish that I had have known how long this was going to take simply to manage my expectations and the expectations of my relationship. So I'm 12 years into the sexual healing journey. My partner and I have been together for 12 years. So these sort of two things go hand in hand. And I think managing our expectations, because after I was seeing this counselor, although I felt better, it's like I felt like I was having these big breakthroughs. Nothing was really changing in my relationship. You know, my partner's needs intimately and sexually still weren't getting met. I still wasn't sexual or wanted to be sexual and still this issue remained. And so I didn't realize at the time, I kind of thought like that was going to be it. Like you go see a counselor and then they tell you some things to do and you're better. Um, again, not the, the case, no education around what it actually means to heal. Um, it was years later that I got this book and I'm going to reference this book again later, but this book was one, um, the sexual healing journey and I'll link it in the comments. Um, and so when I got this book, it was a long time after, but I wish that I've had, have had this book in the beginning because this book really walks you through, like I'm still reading this book. I still come back to it. I just started reading it again, 12 years later into my journey because it, I still need a reminder sometimes that I am healing from sexual abuse, that I am a sexual abuse survivor. And so sometimes I still get frustrated when things show up in my life. And then when I reference a book like this that sort of details out like everything that you could possibly be going or potentially experiencing, I'm like, oh, like, oh, this is normal. Oh, this is part of the journey. And so I wish someone had have introduced me to this book or another book a long time ago. Um, but this takes time. You need to be patient with yourself. You need to manage your expectations about how quickly you're going to enjoy sex, how quickly you're going to have positive relationships, how quickly you're going to feel safe in your body. All of these things need um, your expectations to be managed. And I, I think the one thing that I would say I've learned the most is that the ripple effect that a traumatic experience can have in your life is unpredictable. So I'm still finding ways and I believe at this point that I will continue to find ways as I go on that this has made me who I am. Some of my best qualities came from the traumatic experiences and some of my most challenging qualities have come from this experience as well. But it has been unpredictable because year after year, even though I heal and transform through parts of it and definitely make progress, sometimes it feels like you don't because you're still working through something that links back to the abuse. And so it's really important to be able to manage your expectations. The reality is, and I hate having to say this, but I also think it's so essential. I hate it because I'm still resisting it myself, is that healing is never as fast as you or your partner want it to be. It's just not. It's never going to be as fast as you want it to be. It's never going to be as fast as you think it should be. Um, and I have put so much pressure on myself and my relationship at points put so much pressure on me and us to change and be different and to heal. And I think managing your expectations and taking it one step at a, at a time is really important. I'll talk more about that later. Um, so I got to this point where after I told my family, after my partner and I have been having all these conversations, I, I had kind of finished seeing the counselor because I didn't really feel like I was getting anywhere. Like I felt good with where we got and that was sort of, you know, a huge place for me to get to, but it wasn't enough. It's like I needed more. And so I still felt that lack of, um, desire. I still felt like that lack of connection, not wanting to have sex, lots of sexual rejection happening, you know, questioning my relationship, like, should we really be together? Maybe we were just not compatible. Like maybe I am healed, but I'm, we're just not compatible. 
And so I have more videos as well that I will link about, you know, just that feeling of like, are we incompatible or like the issues that continuing to reject your partner sexually can have in your relationship. I'll link both of those videos below, but I kind of got to that point where, okay, what's next? And so the eighth thing that I wish that I had have known was that sex issues are often going to come, you're going to start working through those at towards the end or further along on your healing journey and all of the impacts of the sexual abuse cannot be handled at once. So the primary part of this point, the eighth thing I wish I had known is that sex issues often are going to be handled later in your journey or at the end. And so in this book, I'll link it below, but she says, Sex issues is seen as a final stage of sexual abuse recovery. Like I literally just read this a few weeks ago and I was like, oh, I get it now. And I would totally agree. And God, I wish I knew this like 12 years ago. Sexual concerns often emerge naturally as survivors have resolved feelings of anger or fear of the abuse or towards the offender. You know, after you've navigated the relationship with yourself, you're taking better care of yourself, you're able to communicate better, right? Often the sexual issues might come up then, or in fact, some sexual issues, like in my case, were actually the reason for starting it in the first place. But being able to actually sort of like navigate and heal those are likely going to come later in your journey, which can cause problems inside of the relationship if sex is a problem in a relationship. So the reality was both of us didn't know what to expect. We wanted things to change. We didn't know what to do to change those things. Um, and we were getting really frustrated. Um, and that's when I went sort of into my next healing um, support, which is when I moved into tools like NLP, hypnosis, energy healing, timeline therapy. These were all tools that not I went and got certified in at the highest level. I started working with clients in and, and, and looked for them and went for those tools for my own healing because I knew I needed something more. I was still in a search to figure out what was going on with my relationship. And in the process, I built a coaching business along the side um, but really the motivation was to figure out what the heck was going on and why I still wasn't interested in having sex. So the seventh thing that I wish that I had have known was that mental and emotional healing doesn't necessarily mean physical or relationship healing. So this journey of NLP and hypnosis and timeline therapy, energy work was amazing. It was one of the highlights of my healing journey. I felt so much freer. I felt so empowered. I felt excited. I felt hopeful. I felt changed at a deep level. It did change me at a very deep and profound level. I highly, highly recommend all of those forms of work. And I believe that they are absolutely necessary after you've talked things out, after you've understood them, after you've sort of got the conversation rolling from a counselor or therapeutic standpoint, moving into more coaching alternative forms of healing, um, non-mainstream forms of healing are, in my opinion, a non-negotiable. So um, these these tools, although I was feeling, I felt so much better and it is a step. You have to change mentally and you have to change emotionally. That healing has to happen. But managing your expectation and understanding that mental and emotional healing is not necessarily physical healing, isn't necessarily directly sexual healing. Sex is mental, emotional, physical, spiritual, like it's all of the planes of existence. But I think when we start, when we're counseling, when we're working with coaches, often we think that just changing what's happening mentally and emotionally can change everything. And I know that I felt freer and lighter and happier. And I just loved that phase. And I was really content personally to, to stay there for a while and not, I wasn't, um, because I was feeling so much better. But I know that my partner wasn't, feeling any better because nothing physically was changing. Nothing in our relationship was changing. In fact, although that was a really high point in my life, that was a really low point in my relationship. 
And I think that was one of the reasons is that I was feeling all this empowerment and I was talking about how I felt, but my partner, um, you know, his needs weren't getting met still. Um, and it's like, he didn't really know how to be happy for me or how to be excited for me or how to support me through this. Um, because he was still feeling so disconnected and so starved. And so I wish that I had have known, um, at the time that mental and, and could have communicated to my partner that the mental and emotional healing didn't necessarily mean physical and that that was going to take time and that was going to be further along in my journey. Uh, that was probably about six or seven years ago now. Um, so at this time in our relationship, I, because I wasn't aware that physical healing was going to be a whole other realm that I had to go through, as well as specific relationship healing, I still didn't understand like why my relationship wasn't changing. And so I, I was completely convinced that we weren't going to be together, that we weren't supposed to be together, that we just weren't compatible, that maybe I wasn't attracted to him, um... I wasn't sure, but I just, I felt like we just had to move on. So we definitely contemplated being together a lot at that point. We contemplated what we were going to do. Um, I just felt completely stuck because in so many ways I felt so different. I felt born again, if you will, enlightened. Um, yet n the relationship just felt completely stuck. Um, and so for whatever reason, um, I never made the connection and no one taught me, no one talked about it, that sex is physical. Um, it is very physical and trauma is physical. Sexual trauma is physical and then healing also must be physical. So later in this, I'll share with you specifically about the physical healing and how I sort of started to get physical. But again, it was later in my journey. I didn't feel safe physical. I didn't want to be touched. I didn't want to, like, I was so adverse to any physical contact with my partner that um, it's like I just, I wasn't ready to move into that physical realm and I didn't know how to do it in a safe way. Um, I didn't know how to communicate or any of those things. So I just, I simply wasn't ready for it, but I, we still had, I didn't understand. So this um, is one of my proudest moments in my healing journey and one I have never shared publicly before. So the sixth thing that I wish that I knew before going through this healing journey was that you need to be brave with your healing and you need to put your healing first. You need to be brave with your healing and you need to put your healing first. So we got to this point where it's like, I have no idea. I felt healed. I felt complete in so many ways after um, a lot of my um, coaching transformation, but nothing had changed in my relationship. And so I felt like my only option was to walk away from the relationship. But besides sex and intimacy, so much was good about our relationship. In fact, everything was good about our relationship. It was just this piece that we couldn't seem to figure out. And so this was a moment that we um, started discussing. I actually was the one who to bring the idea of what would it look like to have an open relationship? I didn't know. All I knew is that I wanted this relationship. I wanted this partner. Yet I felt completely trapped and stuck in my own healing and I needed to prioritize, prioritize my healing. I needed to put myself first. Um, and so I, we talked about it for probably almost a year before we actually decided to do it. What we realized was that we had nothing to lose and we had everything to gain that we believed that we could make it through anything. We trusted that if we were meant to be together, then we, that we would, we had I knew nobody who had an open relationship. I knew nothing about open relationships. Neither of us had ever done this before. It was like, I don't know, let's, let's try something. Because at this point, I wasn't sure if it was just us intimately, or if it was still me, or if I could experience sex and intimacy different elsewhere. Um, there was a lot of reasons why we decided to do this, but it was really a brave point for us. 
And I remember the moment when we decided to do it. I was, there was lots of conversation about it, but there was this moment because I was going away on a trip. Um, and we, we sat down at a, at a table and we had a glass of wine and we just were like, okay, like we're going to do it. And we cheers to the adventure and what was coming. And I have, that moment is stick so clearly in my mind, in my heart forever, because I have never felt more loved, more brave and more supported in my entire life. And for to have this man say, yes, I'm going, let's try this. Let's, and let's do it. I'm going to support you in this. Um, and, and let's see how it goes. It felt like the biggest act of love and of trust and of what love and relationships are meant to be. Because the reality, whether there's sexual abuse in a relationship or not, is you are going to go through so many ups and downs in a relationship. And I have learned during this process that we need to be brave with our healing. We need to be brave with our relationships in order to experience what we want in order to grow in the ways that we want to. And sometimes that looks like doing things that are a little off the wall, that are a little out of the norm, that you may get weird texts from family and friends that someone told someone that you're in an open relationship and everyone's worried about you. Um, you know, you, you're going to have to go through the dirty looks of why would you do that? And because people don't understand what you're going through, people don't understand what you need and what is right for you. And so this particular journey with an open relationship, I have more videos that are going to come. I'll be talking very in depthly about this, but it was a time that I learned so much. I learned that, um, my challenges with sex were not specific to my partner, um, that they were showing up in, in my connections with other people. I learned um, some things though about my turn on and desire of that I could experience a lot more turn on and desire inside of the open relationship. And so then that also gave me indications as to what things I could bring back into my relationship. I'll talk about those later, so keep watching. Um, I learned so much and I'll be sharing more in depth about that. But um, primarily it's that you need to be brave with your healing and put your healing first. And so I knew what I needed because I was listening to myself and I was in deep connection with myself from all the coaching that I was doing. And I was scared to do this. I was scared to bring it up, but I knew that it was right. And I knew that I had to be brave and it was one of the best decisions I've ever made for myself. And I am so proud of it. Um, and you need to be healing with your brave with your healing as well. So the fifth thing that I wish that I had have known on my journey, and, and this I think goes across the board for all sexuality, is that I needed to develop my sexuality with myself before my sexuality with my partner. So the reality was, is I didn't have much of a sex drive. I didn't feel safe in my body. I didn't feel like I could say yes or no clearly. I felt like if I started sex or if I, you know, if I turned my partner on by looking too sexy or being too flirty, or that was true for anyone, any man that I came in contact with, I felt like I couldn't say no. I didn't feel like I had um, a voice over what happened to my body. I often um, felt like sex was a duty or an obligation. I lost sensation very quickly in my body when I would have sex. Um, so I might feel good and then it would just like disappear and be gone. I would always close my eyes during sex because I would leave my body. I would dissociate. Um, I would you know, try not to be there. Um, I had a lot of pain during sex and vaginal tension. If it wasn't pain during, it was pain after and friction because I was never turned on enough. I was never lubricated enough. I was always rushing sex to try to just get it done with so I didn't have to do it for another few days and to relieve the pressure. And so it was just this negative cycle of sexuality and I had no idea how to direct my partner. I had no idea how to use my voice. And so our sexuality, our relationship, when we start to get physical, when we start to make those connections that it is time to understand what works for my body and, and start to come into my body, don't do it with your partner. And I was trying to do it with my partner and it was just like not going well. 
Um, you need to build that sexual relationship with yourself. Like I used to feel guilty about having, about um, self-pleasuring or being naked alone or like giving myself these like erotic baths or it was like, that's mine. Like feel guilty for having some, for doing something that's my own. Like women and we often get it twisted that like our sexuality is for our partner, which is a whole issue on its own, not just with people who've been sexually abused. And so my sexuality had to become mine. I had to start, you know, taking back my orgasms and my turn on and my pleasure and understanding that I was responsible for it and learning what works and being in tune with my body and touching my own body and playing and experimenting with my own body and learning and reading and having sexual experiences alone that didn't include my partner. There wasn't a part of or something for my partner. Um, and so that's actually one of the basis of my women's program. It's a mini course called in the mood women's experience because so many women struggle to get in the mood and feel turned on and know what works for them. And so I have a whole mini course dedicated to walking you through what that looks like for you to build a relationship and learn to get into the mood more often, more quickly, more easily so that, you know, sex doesn't always feel like a chore or a duty. It shouldn't. And so I'll link that course as well below. Um, and so I really think that um, we try to do this with our partners and we try to bring our sexuality right to our partners. And it, that's still from a place of believing that our sex is somehow for our partners, is meant for them. And you need to adopt and understand, especially under the circumstances of sexual abuse, that your sexuality is for you. It was always for you. And someone took that from you. Someone made it theirs. Someone robbed you of the knowing that your sexuality and your pleasure was for yours to choose and to control and to dictate. And with, I find that really just continues into women's life. And even long into their sexual healing journey, it's still about their partner and pleasing their partner. And so they're faking enjoyment. They're, you know, ugh, all of those things. So I wish that someone had have told me that my sex was for me. My sexuality was for me. Um, and that's really when I did start exploring um, with playing with myself more and getting reconnected to my own body. So the fourth thing that I wish that someone had have told me, and I really didn't understand this. Um, so I, you know, my, we're open about what's going on in our relationship. We're experimenting with open relationships. I've done lots of healing at this point. I feel empowered sexually on my own. But there's so much trauma now wrapped up inside of my relationship from all the sex I had when I didn't want to, from all the fights, from all the pressure, from his, you know, lack of awareness as to what's going on. So then he's making, you know, bad moves in our relationship as well. And we just, you know, every sexual experience or most of our sexual experiences were unfulfilling and unenjoyable or painful or ended in a fight or, and it's like, that is traumatizing. That's re-traumatizing. So, a lot of people don't understand that our relationships, even our loving relationships, our consensual sexual experiences can still be traumatizing. And so this whole healing journey, what I didn't realize were all the twists and turns that were going to come in. And I didn't realize, and I wish someone had told me that my relationship was creating additional trauma that I would then have to work through. Because we got into our patterns and got into our cycles and into our comfort zones and ways of interacting. And, you know, having sex that wasn't enjoyable or painful. And, you know, we started seeing each other through a certain lens. Like, I saw him as he only wanted sex and, like, that he was putting the pressure on me. And so I needed to change that belief. He also saw me as, you know, sexually broken or that he couldn't touch me or come near me. Or, um, you know, that I didn't wasn't attracted to him or I was, you know, healing from sexual abuse. So it's like... He couldn't see me as sexually empowered. He, he couldn't necessarily see me in the way that I was beginning to see myself. And then all of our relationship dynamics were just, were just messy. Um, and anyone knows that, not just from sexual issues in our relationship, but over time you create these dynamics in your relationship 
that can be really difficult to break. And so after we had gone through, you know, everything that we had gone through and I had saw there was so much progress and there really were so many wins, things still really hadn't changed because we had created so many relationship patterns that no one really brought up. I never really saw anywhere or heard or, you know, no one ever told me that I was going to have, that we needed to sort of rework our relationship now. Um, because we came together as, you know, um, a guy who was lacking intimate confidence and a woman who was sexual abused and didn't have a voice. And then we created this relationship based off of that. And then that created all of our patterns. So you can just imagine, you know, 12 years later, you, you get into patterns that are not necessarily supportive for where you want to go. And even though you've done healing work, even though you are more empowered, it's like some of these relationship patterns hang on closely. So what do you do about that? <laughs> That's really what a lot of my work um, now is based on. Um, because I find a lot of people that I end up working with, they have gone and saw a counselor, they are having conversations about it. They're kind of at, you know, they're at the point where they just like are trying to figure out how do I actually make the changes now into my relationship and into my sexuality. Um, and so the third thing that I wish that I had have known is the process to actually heal a relationship and that it starts not physical again. So, you know, just think of the healing journey that, that happens. Um, for many of us, uh, you know, we're still, you know, not necessarily ready to see those massive changes in our physical sexual relationship, which can be really fucking challenging. If you're a partner of someone who's going through this, like, I feel for the partners who are going through it. I work with the partners who are going through this with their partners because it is so challenging to support someone through this when you are starved, when you are frustrated. And so I've obviously found lots of ways to expedite this and to help people to move through it a little bit quicker. But the thing I wish I had have known, the third um, thing is sex is after physical intimacy is after emotional and mental intimacy and safety. Because oftentimes by the time you've gone through all of this, there's often a high, a, sorry, a low level of emotional and mental intimacy and safety in your relationship. And so you need to, you know, it's, we need to start to understand what I call the scale of intimacy. I'll link it below. I have an intimacy guide for couples that I'll link below. It's a free guide where I explain the scale of intimacy that we need to then begin to adopt into our relationship because, you know, sex, the, the 10 out of 10 will say is, you know, been the issue for us. We're not interested in getting into penetration. We're struggling to feel desire for our partner. But if we've done all the other healing work that I've already talked about, it's about rebuilding our relationship and sort of starting over. But if you're, fuck, you're 10 years into a relationship, you're 15 years into a relationship, it's like, but you don't even remember how to flirt anymore. You don't even remember how to connect in ways that aren't sexual. And so download this intimacy guide for couples. I'm going to explain the range of intimacy on there. And I have lots of videos on the YouTube channel. I'll link some um, here below where I actually explain why I was never turned on, why I was never in the mood, even towards my partner, even though I had lots of desire inside of myself, I couldn't translate that into my relationship because we didn't have the safety, emotional and mental intimacy. So this is when we started doing things like eye gazing exercises, having intimate conversations, you know, um, erotic massage, playing in ways that weren't penetrative, getting me comfortable and him comfortable, you know, having sexual experiences that always didn't lead to penetration. So I could actually, because remember in the beginning of this, I said I used to cringe when he would touch me. Well, even though everything else had changed in so many ways, that is physical. And that didn't go away because when he would touch me, it would trigger that unsafe, that lack of safety that I felt in my body. And so we had to reprogram my body. This is where we started getting physical, um, but it was, we had to build our way up to a level of safety. And that started mentally, emotionally, and then slowly into physical safety where I, I could, in, you know, I couldn't even enjoy a massage for him because I was always so guarded that he was, 
you know, wanted sex and I was gonna have to turn him down, but then I didn't have a voice and I couldn't say no. And so I like wouldn't even let myself kiss him because I didn't want to get him turned on because I felt that pressure. Like I didn't even want to hug him or look too pretty or, you know, like there were so many layers of ways that I disconnected from him over time that I didn't realize that we were gonna have to work through. And so um, really starting to get this scale of intimacy and realize there's a range of intimacy and ways to connect with your partner and being able to feel safe with just, you know, being naked together and enjoy that with zero pressure, with zero moving forward. Um, that's actually one of the reasons we started the practice of OM. I've done a couple of videos on it. I'll link both of them below. I did a full interview with an OM practitioner. You should definitely go and um, get a lesson from her. Uh, that's when we started only it was a physical practice where he was actually stroking my clitoris but there was no it was a one it was a he was I got to sort of lay there and I didn't have to feel the pressure to please him back I didn't feel the pressure to have to I could actually enjoy and receive physical touch deeply transform uh, sorry deeply transformative for our relationship so that's when we got into practices like oming and these range of intimacy um, and the things that I teach about in my date night experience. I have a program for couples that is eight date nights that you do in the comfort of your own home that walk you through building safety, mental and emotional intimacy to get you up to the point where um, you can start feeling safer in your relationship, more connected, more in love. And then, then we can, from there is the platform that we can increase sexual and um, physical intimacy. And so those date nights experiences, those are everything that are in my date nights are things that we had to learn and had to walk through. Um, you know, and that took a couple of years of sort of figuring those out. I expedited them for you. They're in the date night experience. You can do them over the course of eight dates. I'll link those below. But, um, you know, I, this took a lot of time for me to learn and, and figure out. So the second thing that I wish that I had have learned um, was that um, I really wish the erotic blueprints came into my life way sooner because once I had built that emotional intimacy and physical and um, mental and emotional connection I felt safer in my relationship I found my voice I felt empowered sexually um, the erotic blueprints came into my life and blew everything wide open. I'll link a video below about how I changed my sex life is the name of it. I actually describe our journey with the erotic blueprints in detail. But this is essentially five blueprints. My friend Jaya created them that basically teach you about your turn on and what works for your body. And this is not just for someone who's been sexually abused. This is across the board that there are five you know, categories of turn on and then lots of variety inside of them. And that the only, the ways that I had known about doing sex, the ways I saw growing up, the ways I learned, the way I had been abused, the way my partner learned and his, all of his experiences with sex were all one of those types that happened to work and be easily accessible to my partner, the typical ways we see in porn, but were not accessible to me maybe it's because I had been abused. Maybe it wasn't. Maybe it's just who I am at this point now. It's just, it's who I am. But the way that we were approaching sex was so wrong for me. And I started to understand when we had an open relationship, why I could get turned on and enjoy sexual experiences and have more desire outside of my relationship. It was because of my blueprint. Um, I started to understand why I would enjoy certain aspects of our sexual experience and then I would just like my turn off would just like disappear. I started to understand my turn on so much better when I learned um, the erotic blueprints. Um, and so again, I got to implement this with myself as well as with my partner, but this was a real, a real game changer for me of actually starting to understand. And this is still something that we are working through in our relationship to really implement because we do have different naturally different sexual approaches to intimacy um, and that can still sometimes be a bit of a struggle for us and so I get bored easily I need a lot of variety I need a lot of emotional intimacy and tease and anticipation and like our relationship like I want a fucking amazing relationship and that is um 
you know, in, in order to have flirtation and playfulness in a long-term relationship, you need to have an amazing relationship because as you know, they're the very first things to go in a relationship, but they are the things as to, that's why I broke up with almost all of my boyfriends for my whole life was because I wanted something new and exciting. Um, and so although I love long-term relationships and I've always seemed to find my way into them, I never understood why I couldn't maintain desire until I learned uh, my erotic blueprints. Of course, some of those, you know, some of the ways that I enjoy sex can be linked to, you know, back to things that have happened to me in my past, absolutely, but some of them are also just innately me that I, I never knew because sexual education is horrible. Um, and so definitely the erotic blueprints was something that we still work through today and are still navigating um, because I notice still when I have low desire, it will be because we've been having sex or we're approaching our relationship in a blueprint that doesn't work for me. Um, and so it's like we both need to be aware of what we need to thrive in our intimacy. And when we do it, it's honestly so effortless. It is mind blowing. Um, so the number one thing um, that I really want to share with you is the thing I'm currently in. <laughs> As I mentioned at the beginning of this video, I am still on this healing journey. I'm 12 years in. Um, so much has changed. Every step has been essential um, and every step has brought its own challenges. I'm currently in a really frustrating one, um, a phase that um, I would, I'm going to say I didn't anticipate because nobody talks about it is lifestyle and life hits. <laughs> so what I mean by this is I know what turns me on. I know what kind of sex I want. I know how to ask for it. My partner knows we have conversations about it. I no longer cringe when he touches me. I rarely avoid sex. And if I do, it's because I realize that I lost my voice for the day and I know how to bring it back. So I, you know, I could still fall into old patterns for sure, but I get out of them quite quickly. I am very, um, I'm just completely different when it comes um, to sexuality. Um, in a lot of ways, I don't, you know, the abuse doesn't feel like it's, it doesn't weigh on me. It, that was even years ago, for years it hasn't, seven years or more, it hasn't been the abuse that has weighed on me. It's been the ripple effect about who, you know, every decision or everything that happens into your life creates what's going to happen next. And so now we're, you know, that happened to me when I was seven, I'm 30 years old. That's a long time of patterns to build up. And so what I've realized um, is that who I've become, how I've learned to work and have relationships and, you know, manage my time and essentially live my whole life was to avoid sex and intimacy, to avoid feeling good. Um, so this looks like, you know, always like working really hard and just like not giving myself time and space to actually enter my body. I, can, I notice that I can be very disconnected from my body sometimes. Like it has to be very conscious and I can just go off the rails for a few weeks because I get busy with work and I just, I don't come, I don't have, you know, regular and consistent practices that bring me into my body. And so this can really um, create tension in my relationship intimacy wise, but it can also, it can be a lot of ups and downs in my turn on and desire. The difference now is I know 100% what's happening and if I just take some time, I can literally drop in so quickly to my turn on, but I want it to be a way that I live. I want it to be a, a norm, a consistency that I experience and I'm still not experiencing that consistency because I never made feeling good a priority and in fact, I made not feeling good the priority so that I, you know, would have an excuse. So I would have a reason to not have sex. Um, so these are some lifestyle things. Um, also just like self care is a big one for me. I know that when I, you know, am taking care of myself in a particular way, I know that I'm going to have increased turn on and desire and feel sexier and enjoy sex more. But again, I, my partner years and years ago, I remember him saying like, 
he's like, it's like you wear all these layers so that like, I can't even see you or touch you. And it definitely was a protective mechanism way back at the beginning of our relationship. And so I noticed that some of those patterns will will still linger in just the ways that I take care of myself. And I'll notice, you know, I'll just get busy and I'll put things first before taking care of my body, which decreases my turn on and my desire for intimacy. Um, diet is a really big one for me. Um, I have a very sensitive vagina. I know um, many women do and they also may not link it to this. Um, if I'm eating the wrong way or if I'm, um, you know, using products that don't work for my body, I can often feel a lot of discomfort or like the feeling like I'm getting a yeast infection or like chafing or dryness. And a lot of that is lifestyle. And I know it because I've navigated, I've had huge wins. I've had huge learnings in that area. But all of these things are like lifestyle factors that I, I need to be consistent with um, because I will be consistent for a couple months and I'll feel all this sort of vibrancy and playfulness and desire and turn on and then it's like I'll go off like the rails. It's like sticking to any diet or any lifestyle routine. Um, you know, making just simply making the time and energy to and prioritizing sex and intimacy in your relationship. It was literally always something that I avoided and so just how I'm used to scheduling my time and keeping myself busy and like the way I run through my day, it's like I need to actually um, re rework my whole scheduling, my whole, all my routines because everything without me knowing it or consciously doing it has been set up to avoid intimacy and turn on and desire um, and therefore vitality. And so I think that's a really important point to sort of start to wind things down with is that your sexuality and your desire and your turn on is not for your partner. It's for you. When I am doing all of the things that I know that work for me, I feel alive. I feel beautiful. I feel healthy. I feel vibrant. I feel like I could take on the world. I feel my most powerful. And I happen to be having regular connected sex with my relationship. I feel like we're a power couple. I feel like our, you know, our daughter's doing better. It's like, it is a ripple of effect and your sexuality is a force and it is a magnetic field in your life that can bring so much good into our world and I think when we've been experienced sexual abuse we often link our sexuality to something negative or bad or wrong um, if you can relate to that let me know in the comments because um, we think that you know it's just about sex. It's just about pleasing our partner. It's like we don't make that connection that our sexuality and our turn on and our desire is our life force, is our power, is our happiness, and it is our health. And that is why we need to claim it. Um, a lot of these things I go through in my women's program, the In the Moon mini course, I'll link it again below. Um, you can walk through it at your own pace, but there's so much for you to start to uncover about what steals your turn on away, what keeps you um, out of the mood and feeling like sex is a chore. Um, so there's the lifestyle factors that I feel like I'm really, I'm struggling with consistency. Um, and so sometimes I know that I can go back into feeling like, like I'm not getting anywhere. How can I even be teaching this stuff? Like I'm not getting anywhere. And because when you're in a problem, that's all you see. I don't, I don't realize all of the steps that I've already come through, all the awareness that I have. I, in that moment, I'm not necessarily realizing like that I could shift out of this in a day if I wanted to and, and that I am in charge and I know what to do. Um, so I just want you to know that if you kind of come in and out of feeling healed, <laughs> feeling successful, feeling like you know what you're doing, that is totally normal. Um, and there's just so many things that you might not have realized were, are all set up and contributing to stealing your turn on and desire. So I said that the number one thing was life factors or lifestyle factors and life hits. Because on top of these things that I now understand about how I, my lifestyle is set up, um, then, then life happens. So I've been going through this whole journey and okay, now I'm getting sort of lifestyle factors thing on and then boom, you're pregnant. Boom, you have a baby. Now you have kids. Now you're 
sister's running for an election and you're helping her. Now your mom is sick. Now you're going on a vacation. Now your life hits, right? Life happens and throws you this curveball that the average peop, you know, population are struggling and navigating as well when it comes to their sex and their intimacy and all these things. But it's like, you've already gone on this whole journey. And then it's like, oh, now I gotta navigate this. Um, so when I had my baby, it was actually a really important, powerful time for my healing. It actually um, changed our relationship a lot. Um, but we had a period of time of 11 months without having sex, um, from pregnancy. And then I had a, a significant tear, which I believe came from the physical tension in my vagina that I've carried my entire life since the abuse. I had a beautiful home birth, yet a really brutal recovery and tear. Um, and I think there's just situations like I, I prepared so much for birth. I searched about abuse and birth and breastfeeding and, and done, did so much healing work to be able to had, you know, the experience that I had with my birth, but I never anticipated the tensions specifically that my vagina was going to hold. Um, and, um, she ripped me. <laughs> But she ripped me open literally in some of the best ways. And that 11 months with no sex, uh, when we started getting back into having sex, we have better sex now. We have better communication now. I found my voice from that experience. My daughter's only a little over two now. Um, and so it hasn't been that long that we sort of stepped in to even though we had emotional intimacy and physical, you know, it was better, but it's like, we're just at a totally different level now. Um, and for us now, it really is about navigating the lifestyle stuff and, and me prioritizing feeling sexy and powerful and turned on as a regular thing in my life. Um, and reworking my entire life to be able to access that not for my partner, not for my relationship, but for me, because that's how I want to feel because it feels amazing. And someone stole that power from me. Someone took my ability to be able to feel that for most of my life so far. And it's my responsibility to take it back. It is your responsibility to take it back and to know that you are in control of how you feel and that your turn on and your desire is for you. It was always meant for you. And it's something that you get to share that is a beautiful, amazing thing. Um, so what I will end with is this is a journey. It is fascinating. It is challenging. It is the way I like to think about it is like your, your journey is like one of the best movies you've ever seen those movies with like all the twists and turns and fascinating connections about how everything links together, like your abuse or your trauma or your situation and struggles with your relationship. It is so fascinating when you dive in. And if you can get fascinated about who you are and how you become, how you became who you are and how this is impacting your relationship and like it can, it can become really fun and interesting. And I, I just want you to take that perspective on how cool and interesting all of the connections are. That ripple effect, although, you know, that, that sexual trauma has left me on this journey, I am so grateful to have the tools and the wisdom that I have now to get to share with you, to get to take other women and other couples along with me. Um, within this, I found my work, I found my purpose, um, and everyone has a journey and this just happens to be yours. Um, so we need to make the best of it and we need to take our responsibility to move through it and find the wins and find the empowerment. Um, I wanna end by saying you need to find the wins. You need to continue to see your progress that you are making because your partner, if you have one, they won't. Most of our relationship, I am gonna, say that my partner really his perspective was often and I remember he said this to me a few years ago he said like you know it, it feels like nothing really has changed I'm like 
seven years into this journey, um, almost like my head is going to explode. Like, what? Like, because I felt like he was attacking me. I felt like he was like, that I, like saying that I didn't make any progress. And it's like, I have been going through the trenches of my goddamn soul and nothing has changed. But then I realized that just because things are changing for me doesn't mean that things are changing for my partner. And that's your bonus, huh? bonus tip on what I wish someone had have explained to me and helped me to support my partner in supporting me in giving him the tools and awareness. And that's something that I do now for partners because I didn't realize that even though so much of what was changing and happening was happening inside of me, I could measure it, I could feel it, I could experience it. And he was kind of just like along for the ride and where his needs weren't getting met, where his struggle really was in the relationship. It's like, he didn't know how to get those met. He didn't know how to feel better about the relationship when we weren't physical because that was such a priority for him and still is. And I could never honor him for that. I resented him for that. I thought it was wrong. I used to make him feel bad for that being a priority for him. And we really didn't understand that we were both on our own journeys as well as our journey together and what we kind of both needed um, to do. And so once I realized that he was feeling that way, um, and I, when I specifically even learned about the erotic blueprints, I started to understand um, his side of this and how he was feeling and how difficult it really is to go through this um, with a partner who has experienced sexual abuse. Um, so you need to see your own wins primarily because the world around you and the people around you may not necessarily see them. Thank you for tuning in. I know this was a long one, um, but I know that there's some people who really need to hear this. Please like this video, leave me a comment, and please subscribe to my channel. It really does help me be able to keep um, getting more eyes on this work. It helps me to keep doing this work and putting out this free content for you. And be sure to download some of my free stuff that I talked about here, uh, a checklist, and um, I'll put a free couples training, everything that I sort of have below to opt in for for free, as well as my paid courses, I'll put them in below um, and reach out. I do private coaching sessions as well. I know these topics are intimate and personal and sometimes just having um, a professional and someone who's been through it can help to walk you through what your next steps are, what phase of the journey you are at um, and some insight that you just might not be seeing right now. And I would love to be that person for you or if you're the partner of the person, or if you come in as a couple. Um, all of those options are available, and I'd be happy to guide you. Thank you for being here, and make it a great day.